The Unshackled Waves, Episode 102. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. This week we finally had an end to one of Australian politics' longest running sagas, that being the same-sex marriage issue, with the people overwhelmingly voting yes in the postal survey. Thank you to all those who tuned in to our live stream during the announcement. The results certainly made for some interesting discussion. If only now Australia could solve the citizenship crisis. We will be discussing that and other news with Unshackled contributor Jacob Watts. This is the Unshackled Waves Review Show. Jacob, welcome back to the show. Yeah, g'day, Tim. I'm back again after a, a one-week break. Amelia did a great job filling in, but it's good to be back. A heavy week in news, uh, and it's great to be back again uh, to talk the week of news with you, Tim. And the uh, bigger story of the week was obviously uh, same-sex marriage. We got the results of the marriage survey. Now, I'm actually... Uh, glad for once to be able to talk about this issue, mainly because uh, of the fact that it's now finally resolved and it actually is a bit of a break from talking about the citizenship saga, which is just ongoing and getting more bizarre by the week. Yeah, well, the citizenship saga uh, is a nuanced debate, very interesting. Uh, John Alexander just found out today that he didn't even have to renounce, but... um, Certainly good uh, to get this marriage survey over and done with. Uh, many complexities, many nuances to it. And obviously one of the interesting things here, Tim, is uh, Labor electorates, Tony Burke's electorate, electorate, you know, resoundingly voting no. Uh, and then these Labor MPs aren't going to respect their constituency in the House. So that's just a, another interesting update in this story. Yes, yeah, so and we'll get to that uh, soon. Uh, but let's have a look at the actual figures. So uh, there was uh, yes responses. There were 7.8 million, which was 61.6% uh, of the total vote, and no responses were 38.4%, which were uh, 4.8 million, and the uh, survey had a 79% uh, uh, participation rate. So even though it's a voluntary uh, survey, we don't often have voluntary uh, votes in Australia. It was clear that uh, the Australian people wanted to have their say uh, on the issue and it was uh, a decisive result for uh, the yes vote. Uh, nobody can really dispute that. And as we mentioned, it, it finally uh, resolves the issue and it also proves the the vote uh, was a success. I mean, I, I've, before this vote was called, uh, you know, people on the left were saying that, you know, oh, you know, people wouldn't vote in it. Oh, young people don't know what a post uh, box is. It's, you know, going to be a flop. Oh, it's, uh, you know, rigged to, to fail. But, you know, look at the the... The, the turnout uh, and the result. I mean, you know, the, the left, they were, you know, so, you know, pessimistic, but they've now, you know, got what they wanted. I mean, uh, same-sex marriage is going to be introduced. Uh, uh, Malcolm Turnbull uh, has promised to pass it before Christmas. So they seem to be all quite happy now where they actually fought this process every step of the way and did their best to make sure that this day didn't happen where, uh, you know, the, there was, uh, as people said, a, a big, you know, national hug. Well, the results are uh, as to what one would expect. Uh, countless news polls in the Australian indicated this 60-40 split roughly we're talking about here. It was nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, but obviously there, you know, are some concerns with this vote. For me, para paramount is religious freedom. As a Christian, uh, I want my uh, religious views to be protected. I don't want a rerun of what happened with the uh, Tasmanian Archbishop being thrown, you know, in front of anti-discrimination commissions or what have you. Uh, it is a resounding uh, result, but there is still a lot to, uh, to talk about. There are still a, a lot of ramifications to unfold uh, in this debate. And, 
you know, I'm slightly critical of this uh, voluntary vote. I, I look back to the uh, Republican debate of 1999, and now if, if, if you were voting in that referendum, if you had any doubt or any cast of a shadow of a doubt in your mind, you'd vote no. We've also got a 20% of uh, people, 20% uh, swab of people abstaining from voting or just not voting at all. And that, that to me, although, you know, 79% of people, it is a high turnout for a voluntary postal vote, but still 20% of people abstaining. Uh, if, if it was a mandatory vote, I think a lot of them uh, could have voted no because I think a lot of people didn't vote because they were really, really turned off by the intimidation of the far-left LGBTI activists uh, that took part in thug-like behaviour, blowing up the Christian lobby, headbutting Tony Abbott. But ultimately, the message that George Brandis and Pine and, and many others pushed across, the question is, this is not about left-wing violence, this is not about safe schools, but this question is about redefining the Marriage Act. Now, I'm not for this, but I think many people understood that this issue, uh, in their eyes, was just about redefining the Marriage Act, and I think that is why it was so uh, successful. And moreover, I think it was because so many people are sick and tired of hearing about this. There are so many more problems uh, that are much, much more important uh, to us as a society uh, then if two men should be able to hook up. We have a massive national debt, we have an awful education system, and our infrastructure is crumbling. And, and quite frankly, I'm glad that this is over, and I hope it's taken uh, care of before Christmas. Well, you mentioned your concerns about uh, religious uh, protections, and uh, a few days before the uh, results were announced, we uh, saw an alternative uh, bill, because obviously the Dean Smith bill, which is a very uh, basic bill that offers uh, only protection for religious ministers and celebrants. There was a bill proposed by uh, Liberal Senator James Patterson, which uh, made sure that not only was uh, religious freedom protected, but freedom of conscience, uh, free speech, and also uh, parental rights. But uh, in the afternoon, after the uh, results were announced, uh, James Patterson said that you know that bill was. Uh, not going to be introduced and he was going to work on amendments to the Dean Smith bill. And it's really been interesting to note that the Conservative, uh, I mean, it was predicted that there'd be this, you know, uh, another massive showdown in the Liberal Party room when, uh, on what form the same-sex marriage legislation would take. But I've, I've noticed over the far, past few days, the Conservative uh, you know, opposition to, um, or, or should I say, uh, the push for religious protections has all but evaporated. Uh, you know, uh, Matthias Corman, uh, Peter Dutton have said, well, you know, we well, we just want, you know, protections for, you know, religious ministers and, you know, f uh, free speech. We've got to make sure this is done by Christmas. And in fact, uh, uh, there was a story that Peter Dutton and Scott Morrison have said, oh, we just want to get the legislation passed uh, by Christmas and we'll worry about the religious protections later. It really seems like they've just thrown in the towel and said, okay, we'll just, you know, pass it. We, you know, we're even worry about these other things. Well, uh, John Howard, great Prime Minister John Howard, uh, said uh, to us that, you know, this is a paramount concern. And then, and then Malcolm Turnbull comes out and says, I care about more about religious freedom than I do about gay marriage. Um, was that just to appease the people who were sitting on the fence? I probably think so. And then Tony Abbott also came out from the no side and said that freedom shouldn't be an afterthought. And now, quite frankly, I, I agree with Tony here because you can't, you know, pass a bill and then say, oh, we'll put some amendments or some provisions in next year to ensure that conscientious objectors, uh, Christians, Jews, Muslims, uh, can you teach their kids essentially um, whatever they want, you know, if, ma if marriage is between a man and a woman or to take them out of safe schools or all of this stuff that, that's been, that, that was in the uh, um, James Patterson bill is all being taken away. And, and religious freedom, as Tony Abbott said, shouldn't be an afterthought, but now it is an afterthought, uh, which is disgusting. You, you can't 
uh, do something so major to, to change the fabric of civil society and not have, uh, fr you know, freedoms enshrined in legislation because uh, it's wrong. And I don't know if you're an atheist or a Christian, Tim, I certainly know that you are for uh, same-sex marriage, but I, I'd just like you to think for a moment, how would you feel if your liberty uh, to express your opinion was stripped from you and made illegal? This is really quite a serious thing that is happening here, and a lot of people uh, are just um, quite frankly oblu you know, oblivious to the matter. Uh, I think, well, I'm hopeful that we, you know, will get the free speech protections and that was the, one of the first uh, uh, amendments that, you know, Brandis uh, said he would move. But like I said, there is this, you know, pressure to uh, get it done by Christmas. Definitely, uh, uh, it looks like that bakers are going to be forced to, you know, bake the cake. That's uh, you know, there's going to be uh, no no exemptions uh, there, uh, and it, it's it seems like that conservatives are almost you know intimidated by the size of this this uh, result, uh, especially in their their own electorates, and it almost seems like that Turnbull now he he feels that you know he's finally on the front foot. You saw him immediately after the announcement, you know, come out and said, you know. This is, you know, such a great result. We've got to get up on and do this. I think it was his probably he thought his his best day as prime minister for a while. He's had to deal with uh, train wreck after train wreck. So it's it's it's. I think I think the well, the, at least the conservatives in uh, Canberra, they're yeah, they've they've certainly taken a a, a backward step and. Uh, you know, it's it. It seems like they they really just want to you know get this done, move and move on, and you know we we'll, we might have a discussion about these things later. That is, it's disgusting, really. Turnbull has still lost 23, 23 news polls in a row, and he's he's hopping and dancing around here, you know, like he saved the world from Armageddon. He hasn't really done anything. He's been an, an ineffective and hopeless prime minister. Uh, he hasn't done anything. He has no vision. Um, likewise with the deputy prime minister, Julia Gillard. You don't know what either of them stand for. They're just um, power-hungry uh, members of the intelligentsia uh, who are, you know, just there for the thrill of the ride. They don't have any convictions. They don't have any values. All they're there is to be is popular. Now, what Turnbull has done, he shouldn't be so proud of himself because he hasn't guaranteed the 52% uh, uh, of the community who are Christian uh, their religious uh, liberties. He hasn't protected the majority of Australians um, to have uh, their religious freedom. Uh, which is disgusting in my eyes. But uh, interestingly enough, he's gallant about it and he doesn't really seem to care one iota about the um, religious freedom aspect. Previously said he was, uh, it was much more important for him to have religious freedom than to have gay marriage. But now it just seems to have, have gay marriage before Christmas because do you know what would be a really sweet Christmas present for me at Kirribilli House? It would be to have a win at the news poll. That's all Malcolm Turnbull cares about. He's phony, he's fake, and he's just there uh, for some sense of uh, self, you know, uh, promotion, and, and he just wants to get on the front foot. I don't really think he even cares about gay marriage, to be honest with you. Uh, what does this also mean for the the no side now? Because uh, there's you know there's a lot of um, you know news commentary trying to you know sink the boot into you know the the Christian lobby and say you know look how look how much of a you know minority uh, you are now. Does do do they still you know fight on because? Um, I felt that they made a mistake, uh, you know, by, you know, putting issues such as, you know, uh, safe schools and gender fluidity into the, uh, into the mix, because now, uh, you know, the uh, LGBT lobby, they're going to say, ha, ah, well, this is a mandate for, you know, safe schools and uh, all this other stuff, which I, I still think that, um, you know, pro programs such as this and other excesses of the LGBT agenda can be opposed, but it's it's certainly going to be harder. 
Yeah, I, I think um, personally um, I am a member of the Australian Christian Lobby. Uh, I don't agree with all of their uh, agenda, nor, nor should anyone agree with I The reason why I joined is because I want religious liberties protected. I'm not for everything they do uh, necessarily, maybe only a handful of things they do, but definitely I'm really for safeguarding uh, religious liberty. And I think that in a sense, uh, they have made it harder for people to obtain uh, religious liberty here uh, because they've conflated, uh, say, uh, same-sex marriage with safe schools. Now, these are safe schools is terrible, don't get me wrong, but I don't think... Um, the, I think it was a bit of a nefarious connection to say that uh, you legalise same-sex marriage, it gives safe schools legal authority. I think that put a lot of people off. And now all that I think it's done is made it harder for parents to eventually have the opportunity, eventually have the freedom to opt out of uh, a radical, um, you know, sexual sex education program that doesn't really, uh, if we'll be honest here, uh, it, it's not really on the, on the same level of, of what many Australians think. Many Australians don't think that gender is a choice. Uh, Many Australians are smart yet pragmatic people that realise that, you know, basic science and biology do exist and that gender is not a choice. And now I think that doing this, uh, alleviating that, you know, conflating the two eventually will make it harder to get rid of uh, programs like Safe Schools in the future. And I do agree with your analysis on that point. Um, but yes, uh, we all need to be careful. Uh, and as Benjamin Franklin said, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. And uh, I think that that's what we need here to make sure that this same-sex marriage bill, if and when it is passed, which I think is highly probable, uh, is not uh, a Trojan horse uh, for totalitarianism or uh, the radical gender ideology that might be squeezed through with it. Looking at the results of the postal survey in uh, more detail offered some interesting analysis into the makeup of Australia. So there were only uh, 17 out of 150 electorates that voted no, but uh, 12 of those were in Western Sydney and nine of those uh, seats are held by Labor. And I immediately picked up on the fact, and so did everyone else, that uh, these electorates have uh, uh, large migrant populations, which uh, we already knew were largely opposed to uh, same-sex marriage. And so uh, it's, you know, even though the, the left, they were all celebrating yesterday, they, uh, I'm not sure if it's dawned on them that their uh, utopian vision of, you know, a multicultural society along with, you know, LGBT rights uh, has been shattered with the uh, results of this survey. Yes, um, for me, uh, being a believer in intersectionality, it makes perfect sense to uh, import, I'd probably say, half a million Muslims a year uh, into the country. I'd probably get them all from Iran and Saudi Arabia. And I think this will work really well, you know, with our loud and proud gay community. I think these um, migrant communities that love to hang and stone gays will really just love uh, the opportunity. No, it's silly. Uh, you look at this and you see clearly that uh, there is a lack of tolerance uh, with many, uh, let's say, you said migrant, I'll say Muslim. I don't care uh, what the ramifications of saying that is. Muslims are the most socially conservative group in the country. Now, you can look to the most Catholic, one of the most Catholic electorates in the country, the Mali, okay? It's about a 75% Christian, uh, nearly 80 highly conservative, they still voted 52% yes. Now, you look at some of these Muslim, uh, large Muslim minority electorates, um, some of them were in excess of 70%. Um, and this shows that, uh, that, that there's a clash of worlds here uh, between this utopian multicultural society uh, that the left uh, wants to produce uh, and these inclusive values, uh, they don't um, they don't work. There's no cohesion between the two. Uh, you can either have 
you know, in accepting society that has a single culture, or you can have, you know, um, bigots and racists, uh, all this. Um, you, you can't have two. I think you, you, you do actually have a progressive society, you have to have a homogenous society, uh, and that's shown there. Um, yeah. Oh, the reason why I said uh, migrant and not Muslim, yes, there are a lot of Muslims in Western Sydney, but there's also a lot of uh, Asians, more specifically Chinese, who are very uh, active in the, the no campaign. So that's why I, uh, I, I use that term. Obviously, um, you know, the, the Chinese community, they they're, you know, don't, you know, hate gay people and want to throw them off buildings like the, uh, the Muslims. But, yeah, certainly they they voted no as well. And it was interesting that uh, the, the left, the pretty much the next day after the results were announced, they were back to, uh, you know, wanting to bring all the men at Manus Island into Australia. And I pointed out, you just, you're, you're basically saying you want more no voters here. Yes, um, this, this is a rare time, Tim, when I acknowledge the, um, the apparent greatness of Islam. Because, I don't mean that, sorry. Uh, they, they do, in a sense, most Islamic people, most Muslims, they don't tolerate the, the degeneracy that is promoted by the LGBTIQA uh, radical Marxist left uh, and the safe schools mob. They, you know, they stick up for family values, largely. They believe in the, um, the marriage and how it's a sacred institution, man, woman, family, this is all very important. I think that a lot of this, um, this yes side, uh, it's well, well and good la -di da but I think it's going to ultimately end up in more state worship. But yes, uh, voting, no, interesting. You get Labor voters, but you also, at the same time, get more of a socially conservative uh, family values based society if you are bringing in Asians if you are bringing in Middle Easterns uh, there's obviously a lot of problems crime and whatever that will come in but family values uh, less but but at the same time what the irony is with this family values is yes we love family yes we love to be socially conservative but also at the same time we are dependent on the state uh, so it is a big irony. that's why they vote Labor is because they, they want to have their cake and eat it. They want to be uh, family values, but they also want all the goodies, all the chocolates coming in from the government. But um, it, but it is funny. Uh, this We're seeing a lot of uh, belief. The, uh, John Anderson, the uh, former Deputy Prime Minister Nationals leader, said that we don't really have left and right. You were saying the left, the left, the left. We love to talk about the left. But I think at the moment what we have is people who care about facts, who care about logic, and those who care about idealism and feeling. And and obviously, they, those two worlds clash when you see the results uh, in electorates such as Tony Burke's. And uh, they also know the LGBT lobby uh, know who to thank for, you know, the resounding uh, yes victory, and that's the white people of Australia who are, you know, constantly demonised uh, all the time because it was... It, it was all the uh, electorates we've had a majority white population that uh, had the strongest yes votes, which included, as you mentioned before, uh, rural and regional Australia. There were only three uh, rural electorates in uh, Queensland that voted no. Uh, in our home state of Victoria, all the rural and regional electorates uh, uh, voted yes. So. You know, to to the left, you know, they're you know these so-called you know uh, uh, country you know rednecks. They're actually you know not as bad as uh, what you were making them out to be, and perhaps you should thank them. So, what are you saying, Tim? This is a victory for uh, white supremacy and white power. Oh, <laughs> maybe it is. I mean, uh, look, uh, uh, I have people. A lot we, of people. No, we, we, no, we, we, we're not for white supremacy. That was a joke. But it, but it's a, it's an ironic thing that the, the the fact that this was a victory brought about because you know white people made it happen and it, and people said that oh this could be like uh, Brexit and Trump uh, well it was like Brexit and Trump in that white people voted for Brexit and Trump but they also voted for same sex marriage.
Yeah, Tim, you know, it's an interesting one. If two blokes want to hook up with each other, you know, they should be just be left to it, I reckon. Um, yeah, that's why us country fellas uh, voted yes. Uh, I, I also made the uh, joke that perhaps uh, the, if they ever remade uh, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, they might need to go to Western Sydney instead. <laughs> yes, you get uh, Muhammad and Ahmed to do it. <laughs> So it's it, it was because we, if you look at the seats and it was more Labor seats that voted no, and seventy one of the seventy six coalition seats voted yes, which uh, it, it it does put the these Labor MPs such as Tony Burke, Jason Clare, uh, and uh, Chris Vaughan in an awkward position, but it has the same effect on coalition and, MPs yep. as well. Yes. I mean, everyone was, you know, quick to point out, you know, Tony Abbott's lecture had voted overwhelmingly yes, so did, you know, Kevin Andrews, Peter Dutton, uh, Andrew Hasty. So uh, the, this result, it has turned, you know, people's political perce perceptions, you know, upside down. It is interesting, but also there's, there's another uh, thing here, is we've got a conscience vote on one hand, but it, how does our democracy work? Do we have a Birkin type democracy where the electorates vote the MPs in to um, expose out their views in the parliament, or do we have a you know a Montesquieu uh, French Revolution uh, direct uh, democracy type uh, thing happening here, where what happens with the electorates, their direct voices are represented in parliament, so. There's an interesting thing. I, I, I don't reckon that Tony Burke, a uh, Labor frontbencher, will be voting no, even though the majority, 70% almost, I think, of his electorate voted no. He'll be voting yes. Uh, that shows how much uh, hypocrites Labor are. They just use these migrants, and I think they've openly admitted at times. Andrew Bolt, uh, Andrew Bolt uh, Mark Latham uh, mentioned that on Andrew Bolt, uh, that they use uh, migrants as political props and at the end of the day they don't really give two hoots about the migrants as long as they're voting Labor, they're voting for bigger government and they're voting for the welfare state. Ultimately Labor does not care. This false dichotomy that the left cares is bullshit. They just use migrants and we're seeing that here. Uh, whilst the right on the other hand wants a, you know, a ladder of opportunity where migrants can start small businesses, where migrants uh, can be proud and industrious Australians. And and I think that this, this is just a clear representation of what the two parties stand for. Uh, it is disgusting, really. Well, it'll be interesting because uh, given the, how they've all said they'll, they'll vote yes, whether uh, you know, there's any consequences for the, at the next election because there, there might, it might be you know, a few uh, conservatives in the Liberal Party or um, Australian conservatives who might be eyeing off those seats. Yeah, I, I think that um, the right... Uh, could potentially swoop into Western Sydney. They could look at these um, these changes here, especially in Western Sydney, being and the, and uh, Tony Abbott, I believe, won a few seats around the west of Sydney as well. They, you know, Tony's tradies they were referred to. You know, socially conservative family men who didn't really give pay much attention to uh, economics per se, but they just wanted the social fabric of Australia, the traditions, the institutions retained. They wanted to stop the march through the institutions uh, that the radical left is promoting. And I think that uh, we, do, uh, we do have some thorough brooding ground, us uh, right-wingers, us conservatives, us libertarians, uh, in the west of Sydney after seeing this result. We just need to realise uh, what what we need to say. We need to tailor it a bit better, and we need we need to espouse our family values um, uh, campaigning in these areas. And I think that we could, uh, as uh, people are of the right, uh, pick up quite a lot of seats in these areas. And it could be just showing, a, you know, a gradual maybe 
shift in our uh, political and cultural landscape as well. As we expected, so the regions to be the most conservative, in fact, they were the most liberal. Uh, Shazza and Azavada Jess, um, whilst the inner city sophisticates uh, in the multicultural havens voted no. So it is interesting. Mark Latham of uh, Mark Latham's Outsiders on Rebel Media, who's uh, been kind enough to appear on uh, this uh, channel uh, tw twice before on the on the Unshackled, is being sued in the federal court uh, this week by uh, one of the writers at the uh, leftist rag, a junkie, Osman Faruqi, uh, because uh, Mark Latham on an episode of his show uh, highlighted uh, Faruqi's uh, anti-white. Uh, tweets and accused him of being an anti-white uh, racist. Um, but uh, looking at this, uh, f uh, what's been said in uh, court this week, the, uh, f what is also part of Faruqi's claim is that Latham accused him of supporting uh, terrorism, which I think Latham was being hyperbolic when he uh, called Faruqi's uh, words terrorism. I think that he he was just exaggerating there. But you know, Faruqi has you know decided to take the most uh, offended. Uh, a course of action here, and so that's why this matter is uh, before the courts. Now, Mark Latham claims that this is simply uh, lawfare, as it's known, designed to uh, destroy his media platform. He's been running a uh, uh, donation campaign, Stand with Latham, uh, dot com, which I don't mind giving a plug uh, here here on the uh, Unshackled, and it's it once again proves how you know the the left. Uh, you know, do not like free speech, and you know if they can find a way to shut down their critics, they will. Uh, it's of yeah, we uh, this this year again. Uh, uh, John Anderson again on Sky News today was speaking of. I wrote an article about this on the Unshackled as well. Our need for a bill of rights because if Latham. Uh, as a as a commentator, as a political commentator, as a public figure, um, doesn't have the right to free speech. Then what makes uh, you think, uh, as a citizen, that uh, you have the right? Because you could easily be uh, a victim of lawfare just as much as Mark Latham would be. And I think that free speech is imperative. Uh, they want, uh, I believe, uh, his uh, senior counsel wants to permanently suppress, uh, you know, Latham, and uh, that, that's, that was uh, in the Oz today. That, that's the idea of this, not only to make him broke, uh, but not to give him a voice uh, in the public sphere. And it just shows you, really, it just shows, one, that uh, the arguments of the left, the arguments of uh, you know, a, a junk, a junk website like Junkie, um, are so weak, are so pathetic that they have to take a man like Mark Latham to court. They can't beat him in the John Stuart Mill free market of ideas, but instead they take this man to court um, to es essentially uh, financially bleed him. Uh, but uh, they're happy to do that because. Let's be frank, they don't have the ideas, they don't have the facts, and um, they, they don't have the way of support that Mark Latham does. Um, so I view this as a disgusting and an egregious attack on free speech, and I think that it is our role uh, in a society to stand up for any man and any woman's, uh, woman's uh, right to freedom of speech because it is an imperative pillar of uh, our civil society. Well, if you look at Faruqi's you know, Twitter account, he definitely takes glee in uh, when, you know, what he views as, you know, bad things happening to white people. He's tweeted, like, uh, you know, I deliberately don't, you know, hold the door open for, uh, you know, white people. Like, and, like, it's really, like, if you replace, like, white with, you know, something else, then, you know, people would conclude you're, you know, you're being racist. Yes, well, imagine if uh, I said that um, in the train, for instance, uh, I don't like standing, uh, I, I, you know, I wouldn't give up my seat for, you know, uh, you know, a black lady with her baby. 
How awful does that sound? How, you know, what kind of statement, you know, does that make? How, how does that reflect, you know, one's humanity? It, it is the exact same uh, for, you know, the editor of Junkie to say that he wouldn't hold the door. It's just basic civility. It's basic manners. And everyone, no matter if their skin colour, their creed, their race or their sexuality, deserves, you know, some kind of human decency. Um, and this whole uh, doctrine of intersectionality, identity politics, you know, makes the white man out to be the enemy. Um, but I view this is very, very, very similar to what happened in, say, Germany in the 1930s or 40s. And now I don't use this uh, lightly, but the, the rampant anti-Semitism uh, that existed throughout Europe, especially Germany during this period, were the Jews. The Jews... Uh, were banned, uh, well, so essentially, uh, sorry, not banned, but were uh, lambasted, uh, you know, over their apparent, uh, you know, involvement in everything. Uh, they were blamed for everything. Uh, the reason why the German wasn't going well in the 1930s and 40s was because of the Jew. Now, I view this as very similar. The radical intersectional left says that their failure, uh, you know, to get off the couch and get a job, is because of the white man holding them back. Now, this this is disgusting. This is terrible. And quite frankly, I view it as racist. And I don't like to throw that word around because the left calls anyone a racist who has facts on their side. But quite frankly, I view this as a racist attack. And Mark Latham was right to point it out on his show. And he has the right to point it out on his show. And his free speech should be a right that is protected by a Bill of Rights. And this is a major, major hole, you know, in our freedoms as a, as a, as a society. But we don't have a Bill of Rights. And it just goes to show through this Mark Latham case. And uh, journalists who uh, have, you know, different uh, political positions, I mean, they have, you know, back and forth between each other all the time like if you just follow you know Andrew Bolt's blog for example like he you know comments you know this journalist said this how ridiculous it was like imagine if you know every you know journalist who you know was attacked by another journalist you know took them to court our you know courts would be you know clogged up and um, it's, it's also worth noting that you know for Faruqi his uh, case is being uh, backed up by the labor aligned uh, law firm uh, Marie uh, Blackburn. Uh, so yeah, this, this is, you know, not what we want, not just for free speech, but for a pre free press where, you know, we want, you know, people's ideas to be, uh, you know, critiqued and, you know, have, ha have, have people scrutinised. So, Tim, um, Faruqi's quote, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but he was taking joy in white people being killed in a terrorist attack. Is that correct? Um, I'm not aware of that exact um, uh, statement. Uh, you might be aware of that. Well, uh, that's, I think, roughly what I read in The Australian. He was taking joy in white people being killed. Um, and then um, Yasmin abdul Magid uh, tweets back, at Faruqi and saying, ha ha, you know, uh, roughly, uh, you know, they, um, they're getting what they deserve or they should go home or something along those lines. And this is open. This is in the public sphere. Uh, uh, that wasn't verbatim, but, but certainly that this is disgusting. This is discriminatory. Um, it shouldn't be tolerated. Uh, their racism, their anti-white racism, but I don't think they should be taken to court. And I find it ironic that they are the ones taking Mark Latham to court, the ones that call them out for being racist, for being a vile and disgusting racist. And then they're being taken to, and then they're taking Mark Latham to court over it. Now, I praise God that uh, Mark Latham has got Tony Morris QC on his side. Uh, Tony Morris QC is a fantastic man uh, who has been working hard, very, very hard, um, uh, to preserve free speech in this country, along with the Calum Thwaites case. So they may have uh, a, a Morris Blackburn, 
But we have uh, Tony Morris QC on our side, and he is certainly a man with a vast moral conscience, uh, with a spine of steel. And I certainly think that Mark Latham uh, has got a good chance here. And free speech is on trial here. And Mark Latham's, uh, this is essentially, I view this as a test case for, for free speech in our nation. And it deserves, you know, a great deal of, um, of, of, you know, looking into here because we can't afford to let our freedom slide. You know, we can't, you know, and the courts have got so much more important things to deal with than dealing with petty squabbles between journalists. This shouldn't be going to court. This should be thrown out. And uh, Mark Latham should not be exposed to this vile uh, witch hunt that is uh, taking place at the moment. In the African country of Zimbabwe, the military uh, staged a coup, which uh, now looks like it will be the end for uh, President, or should I say dictator, Robert Mugabe, who is now 93 years old, has uh, been in power for uh, 37 years, and uh, I certainly think it's about time because his regime, it's, it's led to economic ruin uh, in that country. I mean, uh, I know all the jokes about, you know, the Zimbabwe, uh, you know, billion dollar note. He's displaced, violently displaced white farmers and uh, also persecuted his uh, political enemies. Tim, I completely disagree with you. Zimbabwe is highly prosperous. Pretty much everyone is a billionaire, if not a trillionaire. And this is down to the economic genius of former, former until 2004, Sir Robert Mugabe. The man deserves some praise, Tim. Yes, it's certainly been a great experiment. Even though I'm glad he's... Uh, gone. Um, it, it remains to be seen whether he will be uh, replaced with you know, someone better who's you know able to you know rebuild the country. In all seriousness, um, uh, he 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 is a bit of an. I don't like overusing this word, but the man is a bit is a bit of a. He's a, he encapsulates the word irony quite well. He is quite unquote a committed Catholic, yet he's a hardline Marxist. Um, he's a man of contradictions. Now, the the case in Zimbabwe is interesting because it's not necessarily the reason why he has been, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, excuse me, I'm not even going to say the names of these African uh, politicians. I'm not even going to try and get my tongue around it. But his wife, Grace Mugabe, uh, basically uh, forced uh, her senile husband, Robert, to, um, you know, to pose the vice president and, um, uh, you know, vacate that position so uh, she, she could uh, fill that position. Now, Grace Mugabe has a, a vast, uh, you know, s support network uh, of the G40 faction of uh, ZANU-PF. Uh, the ruling party of Zimbabwe. Uh, so that was her uh, modus operandi there, was to depose uh, the vice president uh, and to open that position for her. And as uh, Robert would uh, assume would die in the next couple of years, being 94, uh, she would fill that position, pardon me, and you would get almost a Kim dynasty in Africa. Now, the... Mugabe opponents uh, thought that this was a step too far. They didn't mind kind of Robert being the figurehead of ZANU PF, um, but they wouldn't have uh, Grace Mugabe uh, filling in uh, there. And I, that's interesting. Uh, now, you have uh, Robert and Grace under house arrest at the moment of what looks like a coup, um, and they're filling in the details now. Now, the vice president of, formerly vice president of Zimbabwe, has come back to the country. Uh, he's a 75 year old man, which is quite young in a country like that. Um, considering that uh, Robert's 95, the 75 year old's like a, like a 23 year old to a 43 year old. It's, it's a refreshing change. Now, 
he's come into the country. But as uh, Boris Johnson rightly pointed out, uh, basically what will happen is there will be uh, changing one bloodthirsty dictator with another. Um, the vice president, uh, former vice president, uh, it took part in many of Robert Mugabe's uh, ethnic cleansing missions as well. One has to remember, this man has got blood on his hands. Uh, he's a member of the Marxist Zanu PF establishment. I doubt anything will change, but uh, that's, that's an interesting uh, uh, thing that is unfolding there in Zimbabwe. Well, it's the, the whole... Uh tragedy of Zimbabwe, it's, it just goes to show that, you know, sim, uh, because uh, Zimbabwe, for those who don't know, used to be uh, Rhodesia, which was uh, white minority rule, and eventually after uh, a struggle, the, uh, you know, African majority took over, but it then became a revenge operation, almost like that movie, you know, Django Unchained, where, you know, Ro uh, Robert Mugabe and his government you know, took uh, revenge on their oppressors and, you know, just look at the state of the country now. And what's even worse is that the same is happening in South Africa with basically, you know, a genocide against, you know, uh, white farmers. And you're seeing the same thing play out there. And, it, and it's, it, it, it really, you know, it, it is a tragedy that, uh, you know, these, you know, two nations in Africa aren't, you know, able to, you know, overcome, you know, previous uh, injustices, you know, coming out on top. I don't really think it's as simple as that uh, because a lot of the fighting that happened in Zimbabwe, for instance, and even South Africa, there was uh, these black liberation fronts were proxies in the Cold War. Uh, you look back, uh, there was an Angola uh, war there uh, that Zimbabwe fought in against Angola. Uh, quite and quite another black liberation effort to uh, rid the country of Portuguese. But in reality, it was uh, communist proxies of the Soviet Union. And, uh, and then they put in their despots of Mugabe or whatever in charge. And it was just a kind of a geopolitical bonanza. Now, uh, you look at South Africa, it is a mess. The, the ANC, uh, more or less now, is pretty much, I would say, rigging elections as well. Uh, ZANU-PF have obviously been rigging elections for a long time now. But I think what the nasty underbelly of all of this now is, is you don't have the Soviet puppet uh, using Mugabe to be their bloodthirsty tyrant in Africa. Uh, but now you have uh, the Chinese. Now, General Constantine of the uh, Zimbabwean army uh, went over to uh, China uh, to talk to the defense secretary there. He comes back, and guess who is deposed of the presidency? Robert Mugabe. So not only um, are plenty of people thinking that this uh, coup has a lot to do with... Uh, uh, Grace Mugabe's uh, thirst for power, but a lot of people also think uh, China's behind this. Uh, now, also, if China uh, are to be behind this, uh, they are not wanting or going to uh, expect a democratic society in Africa, more importantly, in, in uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, so I think that there also, also is Chinese elements behind this because they want access to Zimbabwe's iron ore. They've got vast amounts of iron, but they also want uh, access to Zimbabwe's minerals, which will help uh, the Chinese economy in its uh, next step of building to be become a more advanced economy that, uh, you know, uh, microchips, phones, uh, you know, technology, all these minerals will be coming out of Zimbabwe and they want to put in a stable government and a stable bureaucracy uh, in Zimbabwe. And I, I don't think we're going to see a great deal of change. Uh, it's really unfortunate, but what they want, I believe, the Chinese, is to have a stable um, country 
that that there is a reliable investment. And what happened when Robert Mugabe uh, disposed the white farmers of the land? Not only did the economy uh, go in ruin and the the country starve, but it also scared international uh, investors because he essentially tore up uh, contract law. Uh, you know, there. So what 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 grounding? What uh, you know, what significance does signing a contract play, one would ask. You know, if if a man could just come overnight and nationalise or give uh, the land to his cronies. So I think what the Chinese want is some reassurance. Uh, they want to put a man in charge that they know. So when they invest, when they uh, strip Zimbabwe of all its minerals, that they, they know that uh, their mines aren't going to be nationalised or to be taken away. And I think that is a, a geopolitical curveball there, but but also Britain uh, are fighting to uh, put in a you know a democratic or a better society there. But I think Britain are going to fail, and I think that China are just going to put in another despot in Zimbabwe. Uh, the country's going to lay in ruins, and they're going to rape the nation of its natural resources. Well, we'll certainly be keeping an eye on this situation to see uh, how it is eventually resolved and how the nation moves forward. But that's all we've got time for on today's show. So thank you, Jacob, for uh, helping us digest what has been a huge news week. Yeah, it's been interesting, Tim. It's good to be back. Um, and Amelia did a great job on the last episode, uh, but definitely good to be back. Definitely good to have a lengthy uh, and detailed discussion with you, Tim. And I'd encourage uh, everyone watching this video to obviously check out our content. Uh, and I'm supposing this video might be published on Sunday, so I'm hoping everyone will have a good week, and uh, God bless you all. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. A reminder about our other live stream on Queensland Election Night, which is on Saturday the 25th of November, which starts at 6pm Australian East Eastern Daylight Savings Time. So I hope you can join us for that as well. I'll leave a link to the event page in the description. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and comments.